I am remarkably amazed by how consistent the devotionals have been in their way of God using them to speak to me and to relate to you the information that he would have for us to experience together as we get to know Jesus in a more personal, intimate way. Because I'm surprised after sharing a real interesting devotional earlier that uh, <laughs> Tozer would be talking about the same subject, which is really interesting to me. I'm just amazed by it. You know, it's like, wow, cool, Lord. <laughs> I guess that's what you want people to know. One of the reasons why we started Devotional, the original Devotion with Emotion, was because people in my life had shared so often about what they knew about God, but they never talked as if they knew God himself. They didn't talk as though Jesus was speaking to them. They seemed to communicate this idea about what religion had to say and what the scriptures had to say. They would tell me lots of good ideas and good things that sounded good. Maybe they are good, as far as good goes. But when I got saved, I had a personal experience and an encounter that was indescribable that there was no accounting for it. There was nothing in religion that seemed to fit. Now, in the scriptures, it seemed to me obvious. It was like talking to Abraham. You know, God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham talked to God. To me, that's obvious. It's not made up. It wasn't like he had this idea and pretended it was God. Or like Paul getting knocked off his horse, you know, and being blinded. It wasn't as though Paul said, you know, some gibberish or something, and nobody understood it, but then later he wrote about it. No. It was direct communication between Paul and God, Abraham and God, Moses and God, Jesus and God. I mean, I never quite understood why people, especially when I got saved, began to act as though God wasn't personal or didn't speak to people, that he didn't relate one-to-one -one directly. And I began to hear these excuses that theology offers. I mean, our sins have separated us from God, so you can't hear him. He has to, you know, you have to intercede, you know, somewhere between Jesus and, and you know, your prayers. Then somehow, you know, you kind of get the gist of where your faith has to be such a degree that you will begin to understand God in a better way. I didn't buy it. I figured God knew what I was going to think. He knew what I was going to say. So I didn't have to worry about how I was going to say it. I just had to be real about what I was saying. And I guess it's kind of what Tozer really is going to mention to you in the devotional. And that's kind of what he tells me. How real are you? How real is God? Is God real? I know. I live my life like he is. Seems to work. <laughs> I know other people, they tell me they live their life that way. I hope so. Because I know when I put the rubber to the road, when I decide to put God to the test, and I literally, I do put God to the test, so don't think that you can't. There are some things where God says, hey, look, this is my domain, not yours. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways from beyond finding out or even understanding or comprehending. So, in some ways, what people say about testing God is stupid. It's just checking your sources, making sure you've got kind of this relationship going on that you're supposed to have. So there's nothing wrong with challenging that in a dramatic way to prove to yourself that it's true. Because Gideon, before he went out to combat the armies, laid out fleeces, uh, different stories in the Old Testament, we have scriptures reminding us that people would ask the question, wait a minute, what am I hearing? You know, Is that you? Even Paul said, who are you? And he said, I'm the one you've been persecuting. And I was like, wow. Talk about an eye-opener. What a shock. So, in that respect, I question whether or not sometimes we haven't miss the boat when it comes to getting so caught up into feelings like especially at worship services or on a Sunday morning that we forget that we have a person that we're dealing with in the reality of Jesus.
that he is meeting or wanting to meet with us every day, every moment of the day as we walk, live, and breathe, and move, and have our being in him. By creation, we have the capacity to know God. All things that the Father hath are mine, and therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you, John 16, 15. God wants to communicate with us through the avenues of our minds and through the avenue of our wills and through the avenue of our emotions, our body, our soul, and our spirit. The continuous and unembarrassed interchange of love and thought between God and the soul of redeemed man is the throbbing heart of the New Testament religion. It is what makes Christianity a relationship and not necessarily only a religion. It is a living God alive in us. The intercourse between God and the soul is known to us in conscious personal awareness. We have to know that we have God in us. It is a fact of that awareness by the Holy Spirit making that known to us that no other person can take away from us, for we know it. It is personal, that is, it does not come through the body of believers as such, but is known to the individual you know, and to the body through the individuals which composed it. You know by what you've experienced with God, by what you've dealt with God, by how God has dealt with you, and by how God is working in you. He is accomplishing his purposes. How and why is his design, but you know that he is doing it. You do, because if you don't, I question again, as I have all day today, if you don't know these things, you are missing out on what you're supposed to be having in Jesus if you are born again of the Spirit of God. For when the Spirit of God comes into a man, he does reveal Jesus to the man. He begins the directional conversation and relationship of man with God. He causes that to come into existence. Without it, there is only that distancing, that awareness that God is there, but not God is in us. For when the Spirit comes in us, then God is with us. Otherwise, God is about us and working towards causing us to ask him to come into us and to fill us with his spirit that we might even see God much less hear him which we are told we shall for if you have not heard God speak you need to pursue that you need to ask him to speak to you personally and continue asking until he does and when he does do what he says do as he shares with you and as he cares for you and allow him to live in your life And, besides it being personal and not compromised of all those who are in the body, though you may feel more of it when you are collected together in a body of believers, it must be personal, individual, when you are away from that body of believers. But it is also conscious. That is, it does not stay below the threshold of consciousness and work there unknown to the soul, but you are aware of Jesus in you. You are obviously knowing that God is alive and he is in you as you are in him. You are aware of that and he is making you more conscious of that daily as you read his word, study, apply to your life, as you walk with him and talk with him, as you begin to sense him, as you begin to perceive him, as you begin to hear him, as you begin to grow in that conversation of knowing him, then you begin to obviously be aware of his hand in everything you do and see him even at some point in time that he may appear to you as he has in the past, as he does in the present, and as he will in the future. He hasn't changed. He's still the same. You and I are in little, our sins accepted, what God is in large. Being made in his image, we have within us the capacity to know him. The moment the Spirit has quickened us to life and regeneration, our whole being senses its kinship to God and leaps up in joyous recognition. That is the heavenly birth without which we cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. It is, however, not an end, but an inception. It is the beginning of life, not the end of life. 
It is the process of salvation, not the end result. That is where we begin. But where we stop, no man has yet discovered, for there is in the awful and mysterious depths of the triune God neither limit nor end. For God will not terminate this relationship with us, but rather he will cause us to appreciate and to understand it in a greater degree than we've ever known before. He will cause us to grow up into the image of his Son, and we will expand in our abilities to know and to relate to God in a personal way. We will be constantly, from ages to ages throughout eternity, learning and developing in our relationship with God as we understand him and as we walk with him and as we talk with him daily, knowing that it will not end this life in this physical realm, but we will move on into eternity and it will continue on from ages to ages. And we will always be learning about Jesus. We will always be knowing the Father. We will always have his spirit to teach us. We will be one with God and God will be one with us. That is the object and the direction of our lives. Even as Tozer has told us, and as we've been teaching this about our relationship with God, that is your priority one in your life. Your personal relationship with God takes priority over every other relationship in your life. It has to, because you cannot deny yourself except that God in you helps you to crucify your flesh and allow you to live after his spirit and not after yourself. For except that a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. But should he become born again, then he is likened unto the Son of Man, the Son of God, who laid out his life, not just for his brethren, but for those to whom he shared the word of God with, that the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and I will raise him up. And he did. And Jesus was raised from the dead. And if we know that Jesus is raised from the dead, we have that confidence that we too likewise shall rise should we die in newness of life and in a joy that we will never be separated again from the object of our love, which is the person we're knowing daily, Jesus himself.